bring that into the training bar, and that physically brings this to the ribosome. That process we're going to study in detail on Wednesday. The rest of the stuff we're going to study in detail today. So we're going to hit this first conceptually. So what we're going to do is we're going to look and see exactly what happens in terms of what the information is here. And then we're going to look at the mechanism. How does the mechanism actually work? Now, all of this is a storyline. What you've got to do is get that storyline down. You've got to get it down quick. What you want to be able to do is to use all of these processes that I'm going to show you. You want to get to the point that before the next exam, you can teach it from memory in as much detail as I do to some of you that know Get yourself to that point. Okay? So you've got to just follow the story and see what's happening. Yes. Where do you where do the trust line with this you know? We'll get into that. Right. There's the, so the question is a very good question. Where do these transfer RNAs get those amino acids? We'll get to that. What I'm going to do is I'm going to do it like another one. I'm going to go layer by layer. We'll get that. That's one of the other ways. All right. So start conceptually. What actually physically has to happen to the information? Well, first the information has to be a copy. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to take the DNA sequence, which is this one, A, B, C, A, B, C, A, B, C, A, A, which again is the, is the actual sequence from DNA, from your DNA. And I need to make a copy in the messenger RNA. Well, remember, the messenger RNA is an exact copy except for one thing. You and C, right? Messenger RNA does not have thymine as it is place what? Uracin. Now, here is something that I wouldn't say that we, in class this size, I'm guessing two or three of you are going to trip up on the next exam. Listen very carefully and do not forget what I'm about to say. The messenger RNA strand is identical to the sense strand. The sense strand runs from 5' to 3'. We talked about that before. Why do we call it the sense strand? Can you tell me? Right, runs from 5 to 3, but why is that called the sense? The cell is reading it from 5 to 3. Exactly. That's called the sense strand because the cell is going to read the DNA from 5 by 3 by. The messenger RNA is read in exactly the same way from 5 by 3 by. Okay, so the cell only reads the acid 5 by 3 by. So therefore, the messenger RNA must match the sense strand, except for this U to T trans trans transition. So therefore, trans transcribe. This exact amino acid, or this exact nucleotide sequence in the messenger RNA. This end on this end is 5 prime or 3 prime? 5 prime. Remember, I don't write that because we're going to write the gene. We've always run 5 prime to the left. So, therefore, what is the exact messenger RNA sequence? UUC or AAG? AAG. AAG. Exactly the same. So this is 5 prime, that's 5 prime, they're reading the same way, they have to be exactly the same. This is transcription. All right. Now, transcribe the next codon form. U A U. Good. U A U transfer uh, the thymine to uracil. Okay, so U A U becomes the next one, the next one then is what? C A C, and the next one is U A A. Got it. Okay, so that's the sequence that we're going to look at. This is going to be uh, A C U A U C A C U A C A C U A. I'm sorry. So that's our sequence. Now this is messenger RNA. You can tell it doesn't have time in here, so. but otherwise it's identical to the sense strand. Okay. So that's the point. Identical to the sense strand except who replaces U and messenger RNA. Now. What I need to do is translate that. So now the question is, okay, to translate this, I need to figure out what AAG means in terms of what. It's going to code for what? Remind me, I forget. Well, okay, good. Excellent. But what kind of molecule? Amino acid. Right. So this is going to this has got to be an amino acid. Now, how do you determine what amino acid it is? You need a dictionary. Just like any other translation procedure. You gotta be able to translate one word into another, the meaning of one word into another, you need a dictionary. So the dictionary you have in your text looks like this. This is the standard dictionary. It translates, in this case, messenger RNA into uh, amino acid. Here's how it works. 
you've got on this side the first letter in the codon. The second letter of the codon is represented by the columns. So these big rows and these big columns will cross reference uh, four nucleotides. Or the four, pardon me, uh, yeah, four codons. And then the third letter in the codon is given to you here. So let's look at this one. Let's get the A, A, G. So we go over here, find A. A is right here. The second one is also A, which means then here is where I'm looking. And you can see it now, but just to see the pattern. A, A, G. Well, here's G, so there it is, A, A, G. And therefore it codes for this amino acid lysine. So that means that this becomes lysine. Okay, so for the next exam, memorize this chip to the table. <laughs> Question. So is A A A A any different from A A G? Is A A A any different from A A G? Yes. One has an A at the end, the other has a G at the end. Otherwise, are they different? No. Yes. Good. They translate into the same thing. I'll get to that in a second. Good. All right. I want to hear a couple of people chuckle. Uh, <laughs> no one will really remember. And, and unless, you, unless you're doing it so often, you can't help it that you actually end up memorizing. Nobody actually says something okay to memorize. Right? So don't do that. However, be able to use this. You will see this picture on the next exam. I guarantee it. It will be there. So what you've got to be able to do is something like this. Translate this. So what's doing you? What's the next one? Is that? Tyrosine, everybody agree? Okay. UAU is tyrosine. <coughs> and then, what's CAC? Histidine, good. And what is UAA? Stop. Right. So that's the, that is the last sequence in the basal of the So this is the last part of the exon in the basal of the All right, so you've got to be able to do that. You've got to be able to take a look at these codons and be able to tell me what the amino acid sequence is. You also need to be able to do this. Suppose I give you something like this. Proline, tyrosine, lysine. Give me a, a nucleotide sequence that will code for that. Okay, well, proline. Give me one. CCU, you got it. That would work. CCU. We're going to go away Why do I use CCA? <laughs> CCA. Can I use that? Sure, of course. Why is it that it's set up this way? Well, think about this for a second. How many different codons are there? Here they all are, but how many are there? It's pretty easy to figure out. 64. 64, good. You get that number the following way. There's three positions in the codon. Position 1, position 2, position 3. How many different letters could be in position 1? 4. So there's four possibilities here. How many in position 2? Same 4. How many position three? Say four. I want to know how many different ways I can combine four and four and four. And it equals times, right? So four times four times four. How many different amino acids are there? In all, all organisms, 20. There is somewhere around 22 to 24. I don't know exactly what the final number is at the moment. Uh, if you look at all organisms, but the only ones that use these odd three or four other ones are these strange bacteria. Everything else, all mammals, all vertebrates have 20 amino acids top. That's why this only has 20 amino acids on it. Therefore, since you've got 30, I'm sorry, 64 different codons and only 20 amino acids, you must have synonyms. In other words, a synonym being this sort of thing. ACU and ACC equal the same amino acid. You have to have these two are synonymous. Okay, so those are synonymous uh, on codons. So you have to have them because you've got far more codons possible than you have amino acids. All right, so look at this and tell me. Of all of the different codon positions, but on position one, two, or three, which one is the one that matters to you? Third one. You got it. See that? Notice this. AC and whatever the third one is always means three in it. CC and no matter what the third one is always means proline. UC always means serine. GC always means alanine. So those, all you need to know are the first two. The third one's irrelevant. See that? 
And that tends to be the case all the way through. In fact, is that always the case? Yeah. No. Give me an example where it isn't the case. Uh, yeah, there's an isoleucine one and there's leucine. So, for example, look here. CU always means leucine, no matter what the third amino acid is, or the third nucleotide. So, CU, whatever, it means leucine. But UUA and UUG also mean leucine. In that case, which is the composition that matters the, um, the most? The grammatical the least. Yeah. The leucine. No. Yeah, the first and the, and the third still matters the least. The first one also, you know, it can, it can change, but the, third, but the second one's the one that has to always be used. Okay? So, that's a pattern you can see. Because what that means is this. Suppose you have an amino acid sequence like, for example, AAG. That it's mutated and this G gets changed to a C. Will that or will that not have an effect on the amino acid that's on uh, the protein that's made? Yes. Yes, yes it will. What if that, however, was not mutated to a C, but it was mutated to an A? Will that have an effect? No, none whatsoever. In other words, this mutation is what we call the silent. This would be a silent mutation because it has absolutely no impact on the phenotype, none whatsoever. Okay, so any, any mutation that occurs that has no impact on the phenotype is called silent. Yes? I'm still not following why you need different codes for well, the same amino acid. Well, okay, so again, you've got 64 of these, mm -hmm. right? But only 20 of these. Mm -hmm. Since you have more of these than you have of these, you're going to have to have some of these mean the same thing. Okay. It's like so. It's sort of like saying I've got I've got 60 muffins that I'm distributing among 20 students. Some some students guys, you're going to have to eat more than one muffin if I'm going to be on muffin scale. Right. Okay. All right. Now something else. Notice what means stop. Okay. Yeah. Three possibilities. What means start? Only one. A B C. Wait. A it means start and the binding? Which one does it mean? Start and the binding? Yes. It means both. It always means start. It always means the binding. Every protein you've ever built, every single one in your, in your entire lifetime, always starts with the binding. That's the start point. So, <clears throat> whenever you see UAG, it's always also a start point. Because if a gene has more than one of those UAG sequences, that particular gene, say it has two UAG sequences, that particular gene will make two different proteins. One that starts with the first one, one that starts with the second. But the one that starts with the first one will have that second UAG, so if UAG go all the way UAG, that second UAG is not a start code on, so that particular protein is just another spike. But what do I always say? Yeah, yeah, I'm sorry, yeah, UAG, AUG, sorry. Okay? Yeah, thank you. Right? We didn't have an opportunity to say. Right, but AUG, so the AUG is only a start codon no matter where you find it. Even if, it's, even if there's more than one start codon in a coding group, that means there's really, again, yeah, however many start codons you've got, there's that many coding groups. Uh, that's what you refer to. Okay, so, all those patterns there are things I want to see. Alright, so now that tells us that our sequence of the DNA is going to be the top of the end of the end of the day. Alright, so now for the mechanism. Today, what I want to do is to get into actually what happens during transcription. And then I want to get into what happens directly after transcription and the, uh, the next step. And there, that step is where you're getting that uh, messenger RNA out. Then, on Wednesday, we're going to talk about what you actually do once you've got the transcript out of the cytosol. So two pairs will come on Wednesday. Now, here's where we're going to get into a lot of molecular detail. Right? So pay attention to the names of the enzymes, pay attention to what's happening, and what you've got to do is see in your head this process as it's occurring. I'm going to talk about it as if it's a series of snapshots, but I want you to see in your head is all of this stuff happening all at once. Arthur, do you have a question? Um, okay, I'm not sure I follow. So why do we need two sets of DNA once it's said? Yes, 
in a, in a, in a nonsense game. Right. Why do we need to have two? Yeah. Good question. Yeah, why why do we need a second DNA strand that's complementary? Well, the answer is we don't need it. In fact, the strand that we don't need, we'll see this today, the strand that we don't need is actually the sense strand. We can do without it. But it's there because that's what the molecule does. And by making that in some sense, here's here's why it helps. Because you, your genes are in the DNA to form that double helix, you have to have things in supplementary sequence. Because otherwise, the second strand won't bind. Remember that? Remember, this is something that's come up on the test. I have a side of nucleotide, uh, a polynucleotide, like acid, and I have another one that binds to it in a double helix. What do I know about the second strand? What do I know about the strand that it's binding to? It's complementary and it's anti parallel. Right. So those are, those are the only strands you're going to get the double helix. Well, that double helix is very stable. So having the second strand there stabilizes the molecule, but in terms of information theory, it's useless. So it's not good. That's not that's not at all. I mean, that's a, that's a good question. Okay. So now going back to this, there's going to be three events that occur in transcription. So we're going to sort of break this up into three minutes. Really, again, it's a continuous process. So you got to see it in your head, it's a continuous process. We just break it up into three events to make it so it's easy to see what's happening. The first thing is to initiate. I know mean, to initiate the actual copy. Do not forget the following. I'm going to be talking here for about 15 minutes. And it's going to be real easy to forget. What we're trying to do here is to make a copy. We're making the messenger RNA here. Don't forget that. For the rest of the day today, don't forget that's our goal. You're going to get into a lot of details, you're going to start looking like I'm focusing on something else, and I'm not. The whole purpose is to make the messenger RNA. First thing I've got to do to make that messenger RNA is I've got it in the copy machine found in the DNA. Now, here's the DNA in this base double helix. But what I need to do is to get the copy machine, which is an enzyme, bound to the DNA. Because it cannot do its job unless it's physically attached to the DNA. The copy machine can do things to make the messenger RNA. The problem that I face is this. When the DNA is in its native double helix, the copy machine cannot bind. So the only way I can get the copy machine to bind is to open the double helix. To separate the two strands so that it looks like this. You see now, and you see this in your head. Here's one of the strands, here's the other strand. Okay? And the strands then again are just what we were talking about. If this is an A right here, then what's up here? C, good. If this is G, then what's right there? C. Okay? So what bonds do I have to break? In order to get that, that DNA double helix to separate. Hydrogen mm -hmm. bonds. Exactly. So something's got to come in there and separate those hydrogen bonds, open up those hydrogen bonds. That process by which the DNA is broken into its two strands, two separate strands, is referred to as denaturation. So what I have to do is denature the DNA. By denaturing the DNA, it doesn't mean it breaks it down, it just simply means it separates the two strands. And I can do that a couple of different ways. One way I can do it is with heat. I can heat it up. Okay, that works. I don't want to do that to cell because to heat it up will generally kill the cell. The other way I can do it is with an enzyme. An enzyme, we talked about enzymes before, they're, they're protein catalysts. We'll talk about them in more detail next week. But an enzyme comes in here which is not shown on this picture. The enzyme is not shown here. The enzyme comes in here, denatures the DNA, the enzyme that does that is called helicase. It opens the DNA strand so that then the, 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 the copy machine can physically bind that DNA strand. Okay? So, then once it's open, once the helicase opens this guy up, and this thing, this yellow donut in this picture, is able to bind to the open denatured DNA. This is the copy machine. We're going to see the details of this later, so I'm not going to get much of the details right now. We'll see the fewer details of this later. This copy machine is referred to as RNA polymerase. Again, anything that ends in A is an enzyme. And this tells you what it does. It's an RNA polymerase. It makes an RNA polymer. So the copy machine is now bound, and where it binds, in this picture, is referred to as the initiation plane. In the beta globin gene, you know precisely what that sequence is. That sequence is 
No, that's the start sequence for the code for the decoding region. This one is the place I said this in the promoter where the copy machine binds. Chatter box. -A -A -A, exactly, the chatter box. So that initiator site, you might want to mark that in your notes. Say that's the chatter box. At least for genes like base well, but not all genes have a chatter box, but all genes have something like that. That's exactly the green thing, right here. That's the chatter box. That's right where the RNA polymerase first binds. So the helicase has the, has the nature of the DNA right by, in the promoter, right by the chatter box. Then the RNA polymerase binds it. Okay? And then once you've got that there, now you're done with initiation. Okay? So those are really the steps of initiation. You want to summarize it. Helicase opens up the DNA to make sure that RNA polymerase binds the chatter box. There it is. Now what I've got to do is to let that copy machine do its thing. So now the copy machine is on there to start making copies. That sequence is referred to as elongation. And this is a cartoon of it. Now here, we're looking at this, you've got to keep in mind that this is a three-dimensional molecule. So there is no right or left to this molecule. There's only five times and three times and three times and five times. All of that. When we write it, we can write it, therefore, up, down, sideways, any way we want. Because the cell doesn't matter. Which is why we harp so much on five times and three times. Now here I've got the RNA strand. And notice that it's starting here as five prime n. The RNA strand is going to grow in the same way that it's going to be read, which is 5 to 3. So it starts on a 5 prime end and it elongates towards its 3 prime end. Which means that this, well actually uh, we'll get to that in a second, but if we look at this one, you see this strand right here, starting here at 5 prime end, this is the one that matches this one. And that goes up and across here, and so this strand here, the one on top, is the scent strand. Remember the scent strand and the and the, and the Mr. Hardy strand are identical. They go in the same direction. Two five prime three prime. So the other strand is this one. That's the three prime one. It comes down here. So here is the three prime end. There's the five prime. End. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to be bound to this bottom strand when I am the RNA polymerase. So that's where I am right now. I'm the RNA polymerase. I'm bound here. I am not bound on the scent strand. I'm bound on the other strand, which we call the template. The scent strand is out of the way. If the helicase is coming, move it out of, way, out of my way. I don't want to touch the scent strand, and totally ignore the scent strand. I'm only going to be bound and be looking at the DNA template strand. So here I am on the template strand, I look here and I see the place I see. And I say, okay, I need to find the complementary ribonucleotide that's complementary to C. What's that? G. Okay, so what I then do is I look here and I go, okay, here's a C, I know I need a G. Because I'm going to make this, but it's got to be the complement to this. So what I do is I reach out and I find G. And I put it in here and I fit it right in here. I'm an enzyme, so I can do that. I fit it right in here and then it forms how many of these hydrogen bonds? There's three, exactly. So remember, C, G bonds are three. Right, so A, C, or how many? Two, good. So there's going to be three hydrogen bonds. I line up those hydrogen bonds right here. And then what I do is I make covalent connections to the next nucleotide over. So there I make a C in there. Boom. So I catalyze the reaction by forming hydrogen bonds here. And then, and then right here I form covalent bonds. They connect this nucleotide to this nucleotide. So what you see here in your head is not just some ribbon. You see some something in there. What's in there? What should you do? I'm talking about is this. I've got a nucleotide, which looks like this. Here's my base. Right? And then here's another one right here. And I want to connect it to you. Here's the base. How do I connect this nucleotide to this nucleotide? Phosphate. Phosphate. You got it. So remember, this guy's got a carbon sticking off here. Which carbon is that? Five prime. That's five prime carbon. Which carbon is this? Everyone should know the answer to this right now. Three. I think my dealer almost dropped my head off here. So that should be three. Memorize those. If you don't have a memorize, get those memorized real quick. So five prime, three prime. I'm going to form the bond. This guy's got the phosphate here that comes off on this and bonds that one. So I'm going to make this phosphate bridge. This is what I'm talking about. 
the already polymerase catalyzed hydrogen bond formation and that phosphate bridge formation right here. So you see that in your head. You look at my drawing, see your head. So that's what the already polymerase is doing, it's catalyzing all those reactions. And then it moves exactly one nucleotide further up. And what does it do next? Well, it says, okay, there's a C, I need to complement. What's complement? G. So it goes out, grabs a G. Where does it find that G? Well, the G is there in the nucleotide. It's inside the nucleus, floating around. In fact, inside the nucleus, you can find lots and lots of floating around uh, rhyming nucleotides, G rhyming nucleotides, Q rhyming nucleotides, and A rhyming nucleotides. So you've got all that stuff in there. Where do they come from? The cell makes it. The cell makes those nucleotides for exactly this purpose. So it has a bunch of these things so it can grab. So I grab one of those, I put it over here, I put it in here, and what do I do with it? What bonds do I have? Hydrogen bonds, how many? Three, three and the covalent phosphate three. Exactly. There it is. Cool. Now, the next thing I look at is what? I need what? I need a C. Same here. Three hydrogen bonds, the covalent phosphate three. Next one needs to be what? U. Because again, A and P bind in DNA, but A and U bind in RNA. So I find a uracil, and uh, what I then do is I can catalyze that formation there. How many hydrogen bonds are here? Two. Exactly. So just, there's just two here. Because uracil is very, very similar to five. And then another uracil, and then what? Adenine, good. Or adenine, then C, then U, then. And that's it. So I'm forming those bonds as we go. Now, in the time it took me to beat that, I could have done millions of these things. These guys cruise, this is already formulated, cruises down here, making, extending messenger RNA at hundreds of thousands to a million per second. That's how fast this reaction actually occurs. How long does it take for the DNA strain to get separated? Uh, it, how long does it take for the DNA strain to get separated from what point? Yeah. When the helicase first binds? Yeah, from um, the phase one to the very beginning. The, 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 from, from the time that the helicase first binds to the time that elongation begins is, I'm going to guess, although I don't know if anybody's ever measured it, uh, but given uh, what I know about the other reactions, it's probably the order of the other Happens very, very fast. All right, so what, what end is this? Three, three prime. Okay, now notice, I ain't totally going to sense this. Completely going to. Which is why I don't need the sense strength. All I need is a template. But what I make, well, does, the, does what I make look like a template or does it look like a sense strength? It looks like a sense strength. Exactly. See? G, G, not C. G, G, not C. C, T for U, U for T. A, C, U is for U for T, N, and G. And notice, this is running from 5 prime to 3 prime, and the sense strand is running from 5 prime to 3 prime. So the sense strand is ignored in this process, but messenger RNA and the nucleus doesn't like it. Well, they can make some sense. What does it complement to this messenger RNA? What strand is complementary to it? The template. Well, what strand is complementary to the sense strand? The template. Which means both of these strands are complementary to the template, which means they got to be identical. Okay. So that's why that happens. Yeah. So it's usually really like more on the sensor or on the template. Well, okay, so here's the question. Will, will mutations happen on the sense strand more or on the template strand more? And the answer is yes. Because if I have a mutation here that changes this G to C, say, then what happens to that C? It has to go to G. So mutation means I don't just change one strand, I have to change both. So the cell doesn't put more um, No, no, it won't. It won't, it won't actually uh, try to, it will proofread. So for example, it'll come through here, and if it sees a C here and a C up there, and, and what will happen is there'll be a kink in the DNA, because those C's don't fit. And so it'll notice that, and then what it'll do is it'll randomly choose one of those two C's to remove and replace it with a G. Now, if it happens to, to do this one, it goes back to exactly what it's supposed to be. But it happens to make a mistake and remove that C and make it into a G, then you've got a DNA problem. Then, then you've got a mutation. Oh, I'm saying that again? 
Yes, not, now the enzymes that we're talking about here don't do that, but there are other enzymes that do that. They're what we call gatekeeper enzymes. They, they go through and they, they, they deposit and keep reading the DNA and then they try to keep it in the integrity as well as they can. Alright, so that's basically all the gatekeeper process. You know, the questions about that? Elongation. Alright, let's write that. Elongation. So you're elongating what? What are you elongating? The RNA. Precisely. You're elongating the RNA. So here, what's this red thing? Or I'm sorry, like you're going red. Why is this green green thing? That's a messenger RNA that I make. Now look at this. Now notice it's not on the DNA, but here it is. Now remember, DNA RNA will form a, a, a double helix. <laughs> With what else? DNA forms a double helix with another complete polymer. RNA typically does not do that. Unless that polymer is what? It's cell or DNA. So RNA will form a hybrid uh, uh, double helix with DNA. And it will form a, 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 a double helix with itself. And it won't typically form a double helix with another RNA molecule. But here, now I have a hybrid of, of DNA, this DNA RNA hybrid. And this is actually starting to form a double helix. And though it's not drawn here correctly in this, in this particular picture, this is starting to form a double helix. But here is, which strand is this, by the way? Sense. sense. That's sense, your template. So the sense strand is still there. So now what happens is the RNA and the sense strand are going to compete for the template strand because they're both complementary strands. The RNA is ultimately going to lose that competition because the RNA doesn't quite fit the DNA as well as the complementary DNA strain. Uh, yes, it's partly because of the uracil, partly because of those bond angles. So ultimately, then, this is going to outcompete the RNA. And when it does, then the DNA forms back into this major double helix right here. So where does the RNA go? It just falls off. It falls away. So that's what they're showing in this particular picture. DNA is going back to its maybe double helix, the messenger RNA is just simply falling off. The RNA polymerase is still whipping along this way, but you would take the head. So this is just going to continue on. What are these things down here? <laughs> so these things are the cytokines. These are the ATPs that they're going to put into this growing messenger RNA. So these are the things that are pulled out of the nucleotide. So this continues on, it continues on. Slowly gets all the way through here. And then it runs into this end of the gene group. So this little red thing right here is the end of the gene group. It is not the stop codon. The stop codon is up here somewhere. Remember, we saw that. When we looked at the, at the uh, base moment gene. We looked at that. We saw that the end of the sequence that represents the end of the gene is not a stop codon. What was it? Go back, your, go back to your notes. What was that end of the gene sequence? Not a stop code. Stop code is on the end of the gene. It's the end of the protein. Yep. The body of A's something like this, followed by something like this. You're going to say that the T's of that. Of that, we call that sequence. A bunch of A's followed by a bunch of T's. Okay? And we said, hey, look. A and T are complementary, right? So what do you say about that? Why, why would that take it over? Because it'll pull over ourselves. Okay, now here's where that happens. This red sequence right here are all those A's followed by a bunch of T's. Now the helicase gets to that sequence ahead of the RNA polymer. And what it does is it behaves it. So now you've got the template strand and the uh, set strand both have the sense strain has a bunch of A's followed by a bunch of T's. The template strain has a bunch of one followed by a bunch of one. T's followed mm -hmm. by a bunch of A's. So they're both going to fold. And the reason they're going to fold is because once the DNA denatures and it leaves that double helix, it's locked. And so it'll fold into its least, it, 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 it's position of least energy because it's trying to try to form a double helix on itself. And it's going to do that because the T and the A are going to be complementary and they're going to bond. So what will happen is this will fold over. Like this, and then you'll have a bunch of T's rebonding to these A's like this. It won't be a perfect double helix because it doesn't match perfectly, but it'll be close. And now, what I have then is my RNA polymerase that's cruising down here, 
and it runs into that fold. So it comes in with a certain amount of energy, it blasts into that fold, and the fold actually physically knocks it off the DNA. And that is the end of the system. So that's why you've got those ABCs. They go together so that when that body comes in there, it slams into that fold and gets knocked off the DNA. Okay? That process then is what we call termination. That's how the whole process ends. It's very short. This one comes in here, and this guy comes in here, grams into the fold, and gets knocked off. How far does it go? Well, I can't tell you. That depends entirely on the genetic energy that the RNA polymerase has as it's coming in. It's just totally random. So sometimes you'll have this gene, and the RNA polymerase doesn't have a lot of energy, it gets this first AT bond and basically falls off. And so whatever nucleotide is there, the last nucleotide is copy. However, there are some times when the RNA polymerase will come in, it's a little bit warmer. That little more kinetic energy comes in, blasts into this, and knocks you know, two or three of these guys away before it falls off. So that key would be the last one. So exactly where the transcript end varies, and it varies in a known distribution, but it varies based on how much kinetic energy those things have, which is determined by a thermodynamic scale. No, not in the DNA. Well, they're at the end of the gene, but they're not right directly at the end of the DNA. The DNA is going to be so here's what you've got. You've got a couple of helix, like this, right? Here's a couple of helix, like this thing. And then it denatures. Right? Both sides then pull back on themselves, like this. Okay, so both sides pull back. And then, over here, though, it goes back into the double helix. Because the helicase only affects right here. Okay, so, so it's, not, it's not like this happens at the end of the chromosome. That's what I'm getting. It happens in the middle of the chromosome. It doesn't do that though until the helicase. Until the helicase is there. It won't, it won't do that fold until the helicase DNA is there. Right. So the fold won't happen unless the DNA is there. Right? Excellent. Any other questions? Yes. So after the, okay, so once the, the, the helicase is actually physically attached, we'll see this next week. The helicase is physically attached to this big huge complex, part of which is the helicase, part of which is the RNA polymerase. So the helicase, even though it's running ahead of the RNA polymerase, is really part of this big complex. And so when the RNA polymerase gets knocked off, the helicase also comes to the Good question. <laughs> yeah. All right, good. So that then is what we do to make what we call the primary transfer. So now, this is a copy of the coding region plus other stuff. Okay, so remember, this guy binds the RNA polymerase binds where? What part of the gene does the RNA polymerase bind to? The coding region, the promoter, exon, and exon, where's the bond? Go back to notes, hold the Bind the catalog. Good. The catalog is where? Coding region, exon, exon, promoter, where is it? To the promoter. The promoter is what? Head of the exon, in between exons, where you going from? So ahead of it, right. So what we got then is here's your threat then of DNA. Okay, so there's your DNA set. And what I then have is the following sequence. I want these put them in order. Okay, there's a sequence here, another sequence here, sequence here, and sequence here. What I want you to do is put them in the proper order. Each one would be A, C, A, 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 C, B, B, C, 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 and then there's this, which is the catabot, or something that's similar to it. Okay? Put them in order. On that DNA sequence, and I'm reading here on 5, 5, 3, 5. This would be a great question for the exam. <laughs> okay, so 2, 4, 1, 3. That's my goal. That's okay, I got it. Are you agreeing? So, so the 
third Quran comes before the Kabbalah. Okay, so two comes before the Kabbalah. Okay, that happens in the area. One race will start here, right? We'll make a copy. But the start code on is here, so we'll never make the copy of start code on there. Does it mean that? That's got to be the binding. Right? So, I would say not. What about down here? Right here? One, two, three, one. Okay, so, one, two, three, one, one, two, three, four, two, three, one. Four, two, three, one. Four. Four, three, one. Four, two, three, one. Four, two, three, one. Four, two, three, one. So four, this is not a good word, the, 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 the binding, the binding of the starting point where it starts, there's a start code on, this then is the stop code on, this then is the ambiguity code. So the point is this, the protein information is held in here, this is the coding region. And notice I copy ahead of the coding region and completely copy past the coding region. So here's another way to look at this. I think of it like this. This is the start of the gene. So that's the gene start. This is the start and wait. And so you can even really say this is the start transcription. Right, so that's our trans transcription, this is our translation, what's this then? And what? Then transcription or translation? Good, translation. So here's the N translation. And this is then N transcription. So that's the correct sequence of these guys on the Alright, so so the ball, so this is this primary uh, uh, primary RNA, this RNA has copies of both exons and introns. This is mm. true, it does. So the ball, it needs to make the protein correctly the copies of both the exons and the introns. False. What is it, what does it not need? The introns. Right. So we don't need the introns at all. The introns then do what? The introns are already still not quite what do they do? Exactly, they allow that transcript to lead to this bit. So, what we've got to do then is process this. Because here's what we're, here's what, here's what you're going to see. This primary transcript with the exons in it exists only in the nucleus. Outside the nucleus, no messenger RNA has exons in it. All the exons in the XI, I'm sorry, all the introns, in the introns, all the introns in the XI get destroyed as, after, as it's leaving the nucleus, so the process will see this in a second. So, this primary transcript has to be processed. Okay, the source is moving in, it's got to be processed. And what's going to happen is this. Now, here's a picture, which isn't quite right. The picture shows the pre messenger RNA, is what I'm calling the primary transcript, and the fairly long messenger RNA, it's got to be moved on the next one. What I need to do is to stabilize this, and then cut the introns out, and send it out of the nucleus. So that when it gets outside the nucleus, the introns are gone. That's what I got to do. And that process is, is, is the second step that I was talking about. This is what we call post translate or post transcriptional processing. Okay, so post transcriptional processing, which a lot of people stare at me. Probably not the best strategy. Okay. So, we have to process this after transcription. That's why it's called post transcriptional processing. Now, here's where the mistake is they show this primary transcript, which they're calling pre messenger RNA. And what I call the secondary transcript, which they're calling process messenger RNA, both in the nucleus. This does not happen. This is never in the nucleus. The secondary transcript, the process messenger RNA, is never in the nucleus. And the non process, the pre messenger RNA, the primary transcript, is never outside the nucleus. Okay, so the mature process messenger RNA is. Actually matured as it's leaving the nucleus. That's part of what I'm getting to right now. So, here's conceptually what's going to happen. Conceptually, I've got to take this messenger RNA and I'm going to stabilize it and then cut off the intron. To stabilize it, 
right, the first thing I've got to do is put ends on it. And the end has to put out the following reason. Nucleic acids, when they react, if they ever react chemically, they tend to react at their end. So these polymers tend to react not in the middle of the molecule, although they will do that. But they, they, they have a, a likelihood of reacting. It typically happens at the ends, here and here. So I have to stabilize those ends. The first thing I do is take a guanosine, which is the same old guanosine we saw before, this is G, attaching it to a ribonucleotide attaching a phosphate group. But on its most reactive carbon, on the most reactive carbon of that G, there is a very non-reactive group called the methyl group, the CH3. So the methyl group is attached to the most reactive carbon to turn it off, make it unreactive. And so that is actually put it up, put it onto the five prime end of this transcript. And so we call that the methyl guanosine cap. It's a guanosine, but it's got the methyl group on it on its most active carbon. So by active, I mean the one that's most likely to participate in chemical reactions. So you put this really dead group, this, this methane, this, this methyl group, that is not very reactive, you put it on there and calm it down. And that caps that end. On the three prime end, I don't do that, I just, I have a totally different strategy. On the three prime end, I put a bunch of nonsense into the elongated so that if it does go through chemical reactions, some of the chemical reactions can change that end. But hopefully they won't get up to the coding region before I'm done with the messenger RNA. So what happens then is an enzyme comes and truncates this in a particular spot. And then that same enzyme adds a whole bunch of adenosine to the tail. And so this end portion here on the three prime end is called a poly A or polyadenosine tail. It's added after the transcription. So the polymer is elongated. This is a messenger RNA is elongated, but after transcription. And so that's what the polyne tail will have. Right, so now I've stayed away. Now what I've got to do is I've got to get this out of the nucleus and remove the intro. That process is the process that's actually causing the uh, the uh, messenger RNA to leave the nucleus, what we talked before. So you can find a secure familial life plus leading. In that case, then, you had to, if you had uh, the regime without the intron, then nothing would come out. So you're going to cut out these introns. Now remember, when I put all the introns and exons, when I make the copies, here's the copy. So the catabox is up here. This is the AUG to start codon. So that little yellow part is the part that I just erased. It's the part of the promoter that gets copied. And then I go all the way through here, right there is the stop codon, and then here is the part of the other gene that's making all the copies. These light green portions are introns. Dark green portions of exons. Conceptually, what's going to happen is this something is going to come along here and recognize the border between the intron and the exon. It's a particular enzyme that does that. It binds this messenger RNA and it loops. It causes it to form a loop. <coughs> what it does is take this border and it binds this border and puts them right next to each other with this light green portion looped up like this. You can see that in your head. And then what the enzyme does is it clips out the light green portion and slices. The exon on this end is the exon on that end. And the light green portion now then just goes away and just gets right there. And then does the same thing here. Right? So we can find this border, find that border, pulls the two borders together, and then the exon is big intron is moved up like this, and then this cuts the intron out just like this. But that process is coupled to the process that causes the, 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 uh, the RNA to actually leave the nucleus. Now let's draw it. There's no slide that has on it. So here is the nucleus. Okay. And inside the nucleus, I just made a messenger RNA. So here then is the messenger RNA, and it's got introns and exons. I'm going to draw the introns red and the exons black. Okay, so black, another label it because it's going to get pretty messy. You can probably probably label it black. It's going to be uh, exon red enzyme. Now, so there's an enzyme that's capable of recognizing the border between the black and the red, between the exon and the enzyme. That enzyme is referred to as a small nuclear ribonuclear protein. Okay, this is just small f, small n, big R, big N, and it's pronounced smirk. Call that a smirk. 
NERV is the enzyme that actually is going to do all the cool stuff. Cut this thing out and it's going to send this outside the nucleus. So, in this movement, this is also the nucleus form. Now, this is going to happen. The NERV comes along here and it recognizes that quarter. So, it's all the first and better package. <coughs> NERV binds there first. And then what it does is it finds it's got this core. Long piece of, of messenger RNA binds to the, the, the junction between the two and starts moving down the one, holds that onto it, holds onto the, the first juncture, moves down to the inside, until it finds the second junction. And so by the time it's done doing that, it's gone into this position. The group is now here like this, and it's found the borders and it's glued together, and now the intron is moved like that. See that, Dad? And then another serve actually will come along here and find another one. Another one will be here, another serve will be there. And it will do the same thing. It will find this order and connect it to that order. And then you've got the big intron moved out like this. Okay? So it's gone from this configuration to that configuration. Once it's here, then the serves migrate to a docking site. On a nuclear core, or the nuclear core complex, that big protein that I showed you, the first unit, on the interior portion of that, there's a docking site for the snurf. And so the snurfs come along in here and they dock, this guy like this. And when they do that, what they start to do is they shove the exon out. So they shove the lead exon out. And they keep shoving it until they get to the intro. And once they got the intron loose, then what they do is they cut the loose out. Okay, so here we've got this. The intron from along here like this, and now like that. So the other exon, and the other intron. This is this intron, and this is this. This intron, this is the second intron. Here we've got a third one. Okay, so the exon. Now keep this in your head. Don't just draw this and say, I'll get this. Get it! It's easy. Okay? It's just, you see these things bound to these big, long molecules, and, and they're moving. Yeah? We'll get, we'll talk about that in a second. Okay? So now, you tell me what's going to happen next. You know what has to happen. It's pretty obvious what's going to happen next. You tell me. All right, you got it. It cuts the intron off. So the intron then gets cut. And the intron stays in the nucleus. The intron is cut. And the exon then is shoved out. And the intron then goes away. It moves away. And this snurf goes in. This snurf then unbinds. And the intron gets moved out and it moves away. And now just a piece of chunk of DNA or RNA. Now, what happens to that intron at that point? Good question. Okay, so now the question does get what happens to it. In mammals and in vertebrates and in most other creatures on the planet, except for plants, all the evidence now suggests that those introns just get digested and nothing happens. So that they do nothing else after that except get digested and broken down. In plants, there's some evidence that those actually can go and then regulate other genes. And I suspect we'll discover that about animals too. But right now, the evidence is suggesting that the stone did digest. Okay. Now, what about this? Well, all it is is, is a bunch of nucleotides, right? So it just gets broken down into just nucleotides. Yeah, right. That's so. Yeah, so the nucleotides then get recycled, but the but the that polymer gets destroyed. Okay. So now you can tell me what happens next. The next nerve comes along here, binds, shoves this thing out, cuts the intron out, shoves the rest of the exon out. And then the exon ends up finally free of its intron out here on this other side. Okay, so now the intron is here from the other time. Precisely, which is why we were unable to cure cystic fibrosis the first time we tried. Because they didn't have these introns in. Without the introns, the SNRF never binds the messenger RNA. If the SNRF never binds the messenger RNA, they never carry it to the nucleus, uh, to the nuclear membrane, and they never shut it out. And so it stays there forever. Okay? So the introns have to be there to get the SNRFs to bind and the SNRFs to open up. Alright, 
So that's our process. That's the capital. That's post registration of our process. And once I'm done with that, I've got now inside the site, I have this semester RNA and it's processed now. So we call it the secondary transfer. The transfer is probably going to be going to be the rest. So again, this is a mistake. This never shortens inside the nucleus, it gets shortened as it's going out of the nucleus. So you never see secondary transfers in the nucleus, like they show here. And you never see primary transfers outside the nucleus, because the only way to get them outside the nucleus is if they're in front of them. Coming off their in front is what makes them a secondary transfer. <coughs> So that's the process. Now, once we've got that your RNA outside the cytosol, what I then need to do is take one of these guys, which is a ribosome, bind to it, and start using that information to make a protein. And that's what we'll talk about on Wednesday. All right? Any questions before we take off? All right, very good. See you on Wednesday.